All right. Welcome, everybody, to another author chat on the podcast. And today I have the pleasure of being joined by Jeff Noon. He's the author of the Nyquist Mystery Series, Vert, Pollen, Automated Alice, and much more. He's been a painter with a background in visual arts, a musician playing on the punk scene, as well as a playwright. Vert, his first novel, won the Arthur C. Clarke Award, and he later won the 1995 John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer. Thanks for joining me, Jeff, and I appreciate you taking the time to chat today. How are you? I'm okay, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Oh, I'm happy to have you here. And um, first off, you know, how has life been these days? How are you doing in general? I'm okay. I'm fine. I'm, uh, I've, I've become quite isolated, and uh, not, not so much because of COVID, but it's kind of dovetailed with COVID. So I've become, uh, uh, as I get older, I find myself uh, very happy in my own company, actually. So, uh, yeah, I'm quite relaxed. I'm pretty good. Well, that's good. I mean, with everything that's going on, yeah. you know, that's a that's a good attitude and a, an approach to have. <laughs> so, I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, you've had a, an illustrious, almost thirty year career uh, as a novelist and a writer at this point, um, at least on the on the published professional level. But you've done so much more than that. You know, you. Um, as I mentioned in the intro, you've been involved with visual arts and music and theater and playwriting and that kind of stuff. Um, how can you delve into that a bit more and how that um, yeah. has sort of developed alongside your writing career, how they inter um, intertwined along the way? Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, that, I'm that kind of kid, that young kid who's good at drawing, basically. That was my talent at school, like primary mm -hmm. school and junior school. So uh, teachers would encourage me. And so I became aware that I actually might be an artist of some kind. And so I ended up doing A-level art and so on. And, uh, and, um, and I was intensely interested in painting. And I wanted to go on to art school and do a BA. Uh, that didn't happen for various reasons. Um, one of the things that happened instead is that I started to do these um, like little sketches and playlets with this group of people in a room above a pub in the town where I was born. At. And uh, I was about 18, 19, 20, something like that. And those were the first things I ever put in front of people properly, you know. Uh, it's just basically standing up and doing like 15 minutes, um, but not jokes, like like little tiny little 15-minute plays where I do all the voices myself and build props and tell these little stories. And um, it, through that process, I started to think of myself as a writer, uh, in fact, specifically as a playwright, actually. And, uh, and I ended up doing a BA eventually, uh, but in combined art. So I was studying painting and drama and by the end of that doing that university course i made the plunge to just be a playwright and so when i left i started to write plays and i had some little i joined the manchester fringe theater scene this was back in 1984 wrote a play that had a little bit of success at the royal exchange theater which is a big theater in manchester uh, and and i thought okay well that's what i am now i'm a playwright in fact I couldn't be more wrong because I could not write a second play <laughs> uh, that anybody wanted to put on. Uh, and I just got rejection slip after rejection slip. And I thought, well, this isn't, I was, you know, it was upsetting to me, but I was young. So I was resilient and I just moved on and did other stuff like you do when you're young. Um, eventually I ended up, and I was still trying to do it, but I just wasn't getting it. And then I ended up working at Waterstones bookshop in Manchester. This was in the, late 80s early 90s and that's where i wrote oh, nice. this book called vert i was running the science fiction section that was one of my jobs um i'd been really into cyberpunk i was one of those people that when they opened neuromancer and read that first line it was like at last you know someone is speaking to me um and that was i think mm -hmm. like 83 84 that came out so there was like a big gap. And I remember going to the pub with my friend Nick, my best mate at the time, Nick, and we would talk about science fiction and cyberpunk and all this stuff. And we would often consider why isn't there a British version or an English version even of uh, William Gibson, you know. Uh, 
little thinking that a few years later I might actually become that person, you know. So <laughs> it was it was it was a surprise to me when I wrote a novel. It really was. It was a big surprise, yeah. And and when you decided to start writing Vert, I mean you were you were working part or you were working at Waterstones, but you were also writing it. But what was your sort of thought process about um the actual book itself and I was and, I was working at everything. night. Yeah, it, it it took me by surprise. I was interested in virtual reality at the time because that was just coming over to Britain. I was reading these books, these American books that were coming into the shop, all about making virtual reality real, you know. So I getting all that. There's mm-hmm. lots of stuff. It was the rave era in Manchester, which was really big. So all that music scene, the bass, the, the tie dye, the you know, the whole baggy thing was going on. Uh, people were taking ecstasy. Um, uh, and so when I wrote down and I, I, went, I sat down to write this book at night whilst I was uh, working in the shop in the day, uh, and it just all went in. It's like a classic first novel in the sense that you've got like 15 years of frustration just going into this one text, you know, and 15 years of ideas. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yep. That's your great. Yeah. That's the all great way to write a first novel, I think. Uh, and all of it coming in through this yeah, burst of inspiration. Just, just right. This is it. And inspiration. I, yeah. And you didn't, I didn't think that anything would happen to it because it was going to be published by a very small publisher. A friend of mine in Manchester was starting his own press. So it was tiny. And this is before the internet, remember. So there's no way of really pub- publicizing stuff. Anyway, we put it out. Uh, it started to get known on the streets of Manchester because it seemed like I was writing in a way about the rave era, you know, and about kids going to clubs and taking this weird drug. So it seemed like I, that's what I was doing. So I, it became known in Manchester as a thing. Uh, and then it won the RC Clark and then it went on to have its, you know, its life in the world. So that's basically, but it did take me by surprise completely when I sat down. I didn't have any idea I'd write a novel at all. I didn't think it was possible to write a novel. Um, you know what I mean? <laughs> I didn't. Mm-hmm. And, then, like and then it just kind of 19, took on a life of its 80, own. You know? I can't write it. I can't. <laughs> yeah, you I can't it, write 80,000 words. It's just madness. How can I? Yeah. <laughs> I know. No, 80,000 words is nothing to me. Yeah. It's like, that's like, oh, yeah, that's six months. You know what I mean? So, but the, so, um, yeah, it's a phantasmagorical experience all around, I think, writing that book, you know. But I look back on it, it was, a, it was an exciting time, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you touched on two things, so uh, cyberpunk and music. So first off, cyberpunk, um, you know, being in the UK, what was your perspective on, you know, cyberpunk at that time, which was mostly an American uh, movement? And, you know, you you said that you felt like, Britain needed its own um, interpretation or remix of of cyberpunk for 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 the UK at that time. So, what was your perspective on on cyberpunk? And you you want to dig a little deeper into what your um, reactions were to Neuromancer and all the technology that's coming up at this time? <laughs> I'll try. I'll try. Yeah. So, <laughs> I think that um, I mean. Just to look at me and science fiction, okay. So I read a lot of science fiction when I was young, right? And the probably the most, if I think about the writers that really affected me, would be Ray Bradbury, say, because he's very romantic, and I view myself as a romantic artist. So I'm definitely that that will go to me. But when I discovered J.G. Ballard, that was the big moment for me, and he was specifically writing about Britain. And England, and he was writing about it in a very personal way, with a very unique vision um, that belonged only to him. And so, when you engage with one of his stories, you're entering Ballard's mind, and he's showing you what contemporary Britain is like through his eyes. And that f- absolutely fascinated me. Um, the other thing I really liked about Ballard, and this is a bit contentious because some people think the opposite, but when I read it as a young a young man, I thought of him as as 
it seemed like he was celebrating the possibilities of the future, of the present day, of technology. And I know it's difficult to think because, okay, he's writing books about car crashes and so on, and it's people, some some people say he, he, he's issuing a hideous warning about the dangers of you know society and all that. I never got that from him personally. I felt there was a more celebratory aspect to him, and I, that really appealed to me because I am an optimist and anything that any kind of art that celebrates the possibilities of life, I tend to react to quite well. And um, I was very interested in that idea that there was this unique voice, like you could tell from Ballard from one sentence that that's Ballard, right? And I got that from Neuromancer. Gibson managed in a way to invent his own personal language to talk about these things. And again, for me, there was that celebratory aspect to it, that total being in the moment of the now, if you know what I mean. It's, um, and that the technology was helping his characters to engage with that moment of the now. When they entered cyberspace, that's what they were doing. They were dwelling into it, swimming in it, in the possibilities of the expansion of the human mind through technology. So all that's coming in. But I am sitting in Manchester, in rainy Manchester, the grey, rainy Manchester, you know what I mean, with our... <laughs> Joy Division overcoats on and our, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's very different, isn't it? Well, maybe you don't know, but in the 80s and 90s, it was all quite grey. I, ha- I have been to Manchester. Yeah. You know, Joy Division and, and those kind of punk, post-punk bands, they are, they caught the, the era very, very well. So, so it's difficult to imagine taking anything as vibrant and as exciting and, and, and as wonderful and over the top as no man should put into Britain. So it seemed that there needed to be a different approach to it. You know, and I think when the rave era started, suddenly there was this explosion of colour uh, and psychedelia again came back into the focus. And, and I think I kind of lodged onto that in a way. Um, I think later on, I, I think I made a discovery uh, for myself, which is that technology in cyberpunk, it, in a way, penetrates the flesh. It becomes part of the body. So the technology isn't out there in the world like it is with Ballard. It's actually part of you. And you're having a very, very intimate relationship with it. And it seemed to all be about information, you know, coming into you. Uh, and you're processing that information and, and, and having a relationship with it. And I thought, well, that's information is one thing in that Gibsonian sense of information, in, a, in a, a corporate information, if you like. But isn't music information as well? You know, isn't dreams, dreams are also a kind of information. And so why can't cyberpunk? interact not with corporate information, which I have no interest in at all, personally, (laughs) but why can't it interact with music and dreams and drugs as though all those things are information in that cyberpunk sense? I'm putting way too much kind of knowledge onto this in terms of me back then, okay? You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm not thinking this stuff. (laughs) I'm just sitting. I'm just sitting down writing this mad novel, but kind of unconsciously, it's all there waiting to happen, you know? And so I'm trying to channel it all um, and trying to produce something that was about kids on, in the streets of Manchester, that young experience. You know, some of my friends say, some of my friends who are my age say, well, you're actually, you're actually writing about the punk here. And in a way I was, because that's when I was that young doing that kind of mad stuff in the, 70s you know 77 and that so there's a lot of stuff there going on in that book uh a lot of stuff yeah yeah but and it was um, as i say when you write a first novel you, you don't really have control you don't have control when you write a first novel because you're learning how to craft and craft the words you know so it's just you just become in this kind of funnel and it all comes in and anyone out there sh- trying to write a first novel just open yourself up to everything and then try your best to channel it. Yeah, because Vert, you know, you mentioned information, and I, I, I really like how you 
approach it from the perspective that information comes in so many different forms and it could come in the form of a dream. It could come in the form of drugs or music and all these inputs that are basically coming from the world and interacting with us internally. So this like external internal relationship and, you know, Vert really captures a mood and a scene. And like you say, it was an unconscious reaction to the, to the rave scene in Manchester and the way people were living and the, you know, the joy divisions and all these other bands and all of that comes out and creates this really evocative, powerful mood that permeates the whole novel. And then on top of that, like you say, you're writing your first novel and it it works for that particular narrative because it feels like a fever dream based on all the inputs and information that are coming through. Um, and so it has this really surreal quality and you're just kind of living it through the bewildered eyes of the, of the main character. But the result is something that is um, super unique. And I feel like you did a good job of being inspired by J.G. Ballard, by Neuromancer, by the cyberpunk movement, but translating it into something that felt quintessentially British. So, yeah, I uh, applaud you for that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I had to, it, <laughs> thank you. Uh, the, the, I had in my mind, I, I don't know if you've read this, but I have these two creative laws that I follow. I invented them when I was quite young, about 8, 19 or 20. <clears throat> so when I was writing Vert, the other thing I was doing is I had these two laws in my mind. And every single word I've ever written comes through these two laws. So that idea of the unique voice, the first law is forcing me. I mean, physically, mentally, spiritually, forcing me to be as unique as possible. <laughs> it's really <laughs> strange to talk about it because it's such a personal thing to me and i have tried to yeah. explain it some of these two laws in interviews but they always come over as a bit kind of empty you know they don't mean much to anyone other than me but they're my guiding pulse and it's very important to me because of the writers that i adored when i was younger that they had that unique voice and i've always tried to do that uh in my own work to create that that you know, that, that, that idea I said with Ballard, this is a, you write, that's a sentence, that's a Balladian sentence, that's what I've gone for as much as I can. So that was a big influence. That. So not so much like taking direct influence from people, but just being inspired by them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that for me definitely comes through because um, the, the style that you have is very unique and, you know, you do a lot of... Uh, how would I say, sort of like surrealism and genre blending in that sense. Um, what does it, what does it do for you in order to, you know, put a novel out there to bring in different genres or surrealist aspects and then mix that with um, different uh, prose techniques such as poetry or more like avant-garde experimental stuff? Um, how does that, come into play through your writing process and then how you express yourself and how you create a narrative? I think when I was younger, it was all about, for me, cutting out the middle. So by that, I mean the kind of the, the well-made novel I didn't have any interest in, but the well-made literary novel, if you like, I didn't have any interest in when I was young. I really liked reading like weird experimental avant-garde texts. And I also loved reading like reading, reading really pulpy crime novels and stuff like that. So I created this idea of the Avant Pulp uh, a few <laughs> years after the, to try and describe that feeling of cutting out the middle, uh, that all that concern with, that the well-made literary novel has, but going for these, using avant-garde techniques and pulp techniques and jamming them together. Uh, so because... That pulp aspect gives me the storytelling techniques that I need because I only want to tell stories. That's basically what I want to do. So I never want to write novels. Uh, I don't want to write novels that are like just experimental texts, you know what I mean? So I like it when, when the two are combined in that way where you're inventing new ways of telling stories, using techniques that in some way 
um, correspond or, in, or influenced by the world around you, by society and the way that people are acting and their attitudes and their social uh, considerations and, and, and the language that people are using and so on. Um, and I think that when in that first part of my career, I was definitely doing that. And um, as I get older, obviously, you know, things change as you get older. But that, that idea that I haven't put was very important. I think the other thing that I did, and this is this was a very specific moment. I should just say, by the way, that um, I'm not I'm not the kind of writer that has theories and then I write. I just get mad ideas. I write, and then out of them blossoms the uh, the considerations of of what I'm doing. You see, yeah. So. Uh, there was there was this so all of a lot of the things that I've invented over time, they've come out of me being in certain situations, picking something up or seeing something and thinking, oh right, oh you could do that. And this is a very specific situation where there was a book came out called um, Disco Biscuits. I don't know if you ever saw that one. Did you see that one? No, yeah. I didn't. Tell it was me an about anthology that. of stories. Put together, yeah, it was an anthology of stories put together by that about the rave era by that new generation. I was part of a new generation, if you like, of British novelists. Uh, <clears throat> there was Irving Welsh was the most famous of us, okay, but there was about twenty of us in this anthology, and it the type disco biscuits. In case people don't know, is a, a nickname for ecstasy. Yeah, so <laughs> it got quite a bit of press. This book. Because it's like 20 young or youngish people writing exciting modern stories about the current scene. So it did quite well. And we went on a tour. And, but not of bookshops, which was what I was used to, but of clubs, which was very strange. So, you know, you would turn up in this, the chill-out room of a club, you know, and you would be asked to read. And, of course, not many people knew what you were, what you were doing there spoiling their night out you know but the <laughs> i was waiting to go on and uh, irving welsh irving welsh was on this tour there was like six of us on the tour you know and the writer before me was on stage and, and i could hear this techno music pounding through the wall from the main room and it was interfering with his with his words and i turned to sarah the editor of the book and i said to her I said this sentence, I said, what would it be like to write a dub, a dub version of a story? Right. Now, by dub, I'm specifically referring to dub reggae, uh, which is a kind of a, 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 an invention in Jamaica where they would take, on the B-side of a single, the producer would take the A-side song and mess with it using the controls. And I, in the punk era, in Britain, kids really picked up on dub reggae. Dub and punk go together, okay? And so, <clears throat> and I've always was fascinated by that process where you take something that's finished and take things away from it to reveal the bones, the skeleton of the music. So when I said that story, it all just came out of that moment, you know. So I went home after the tour and I started, I was, I was writing information and I started to remix or do these dub versions of certain passages. And I think that was the beginning of the second part of my, my writing career, that. And I became fascinated with inventing new ways of writing that were borrowing ideas from music, like scratching, like remixing, sampling. You know, I was mad on it. I was mad on it. And that's, <laughs> that's an idea of where you've got the Avent Pulp, where you're doing... You're actually doing something that's quite experimental, you know, a bit in a way it's a version of the cut-up technique, but, you know, different. But you're actually taking it from, from techno music, you know, so it's like uh, and using it to tell stories and also using it to um, reflect and to portray the character in the moment. So again, I'm not, not really interested in experimental techniques for their own ideas. I just want to use them because the characters, the way I write them, they often enter into these extraordinary situations where they start to lose their sense of self. And so to use these experimental techniques, then it's very good because you can reveal what they're going through, you know, um, 
That's that's it, fascinating. And sometimes when you do it quite well, yeah, when you do it quite well, sometimes readers don't actually know you're doing it because you're following because they're in the character and the character's doing it. Like I always think in like in the third Nyquist novel, which we'll come on to, there's there's a one thousand three hundred word sentence in it. Now, not many people have noticed this. No one's ever pointed it out to me. And I think that's because Nyquist at that moment is so overcome with so much stuff that that 1,300-word sentence is his natural way of explaining an experience in the world, you see. So it's using experimental techniques, embedding them deep into narrative, deep. So they're not just placed on top. They're in the center of it. They come out and they come out through the character. Yeah, this is um, this is really interesting because in in university in my in my fourth and final year, uh, I had one uh, course where for my final presentation and final project of the year, I actually did um, a focus on remix culture. Uh, in the convergence of uh, music and storytelling and how remix is remixes or dubs are actually a way of um, having a conversation and deepening the experience with a given medium, whether it's music or whether it's uh, written text or um, what, what have you. And I think it, it, it blows my mind to hear your, your perspective on this because, you know, reading your work, I definitely have this sensation of um, being more deeply ingrained in the story and the and the characters, and feeling this sense of uh, surreal investment just based on the the way that you uh, remix or the way that you approach writing techniques in order to give more. Um, in order to give more depth to whatever is happening. So, you know, that 1300 word sentence, that kind of thing is like, uh, it's, it's a more stream of consciousness reflection of Nyquist and what's happening to him in that particular moment. And you use the medium within which you are writing and working in order to convey that experience and using story and technique in conjunction to just show how fucked up and 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 out of control Nyquist's uh situation is or all the information that he's he's receiving and just trying to process so um i really like that that approach that you take and then so i have this i have this little uh i have this little two line manifesto okay uh, let me see if i get this right form is the host Content is the virus. Infect, infect. And I wrote that quite <laughs> a number of years ago. I wrote that, but I think that sums up a lot of what I'm talking about. Okay, so like form is the host. That's the body of the narrative. Yeah, the story, the way it is, the the, the subject matter, what it is, how it works in the world. The content flows into the form, and it in in this idea, it it infests and infects. The, the form of the story like a virus. So it's starting to change the narrative. The content itself is changing the story. Because I think that um, for me, that kind of postmodern moment is really about content, people experimenting with content rather than form. I think that, I mean, that's my own way of viewing it. It might be wrong, but modernism, which I love, is perceived to be people experimenting with form. Yeah. With postmodern, people start to experiment with content. And I think that was a really interesting change of attitude. And I definitely thinking of myself in, in those terms. Um, and it's, uh, yeah. it's building off of uh, McLuhan's um, notion of the, the medium is the message, essentially, that what medium you're in acts as a vessel for the stories that you want to tell the message that you want to convey and so like you say the the actual form itself is the host and therefore 
what you put onto the page infects it and shifts the narrative based on whatever that particular virus is uh yeah. needs or methods of of, of the, transference the, yeah the content can infect the character and it and infect the story exactly it can infect both of those things at once or separately so um it's a good way of thinking about it as you're writing and Often when you write, I mean, there are two main ways, two kind of ways of writing for me. When you're process of writing, you're either thinking about stuff and writing it down, or then there are those moments when you're not thinking anymore. You're just writing. Okay, so it's important to recognize during the process of 100,000 words that those two things are both equally important. Uh, and that one, when one of them arrives, when you're doing one of them, it means that's what the story wants at that time. When you're doing the other, that's what the story wants. So when it happens, go with it. So I always think when I get these mad moments, uh, when I just go into the stream of consciousness stuff, I, I quite enjoy that. But then I pull back and I say, okay, now let's try and control this. What is actually being said? You know, what's been revealed by this automatic writing, if you like, in the, in the, in the surrealist mm-hmm. term. Um, and so it's that push and pull all the time between. Uh, sorry the, to interrupt. It, um, I was going to say, like, you include a lot of references to classic literature as well as uh, mythology. And so when you're in this process of sort of automatic stream of consciousness, and then and then pulling things back, and and having this back and forth, um, not battle, but this back and forth interaction of control. Um, how do you incorporate things like? Uh, you know, in automated Alice, you have Alice in Wonderland as this as this uh, big inspiration and this big influence on the story. And you're like we talked about earlier, yeah. remixing that and working yeah. it around, but in a way that is much more um your style, but also chaotic in a way that is that is um reacting to the equally chaotic uh, narrative of. Alice in Wonderland or through the looking glass. So how do you, how do you approach that in terms of, you know, the mythology that you put in the uh, influences and weaving that into a narrative that feels like your own? I would say, yeah, I'm not, um, I think most of the time, I hope this doesn't disappoint. It's almost like accidental in a way. Uh, it's like <laughs> using that whole thing of what you are, you know, and being open to that so that when something arrives and you think, oh, this is like that, you don't be as scared of using that because it just means that you're plugging yourself into the universal, you know, and it's uh, it's always good to do that. So. It's like um, it's very difficult for me to explain this kind of stuff, to be honest. <laughs> but the uh, some questions are quite difficult. It's, it's some of the things that you're talking about, it's like with Alice. It's like you know, what does Alice mean to me? That's that's the important thing. Okay, it's not just that I'm picking up a book and thinking, okay, now I'm going to do Alice, right? It's like you know, I, I, I always read Alice at school by the teacher. And then at art school, when I was, I think, probably in my BA, I, re, I discovered Martin Gardner's uh, Annotated Alice, which is a great book. It, it explains a lot of the hidden mysteries and codes and ciphers that Lewis Carroll was using in those books. So, I became fascinated by that, you know, and then and then when when I was writing Vert and all that, and just this sentence arrived, which was curious or curious, and so that Alice sentence arrived in Vert, right? And so at that point, you're thinking, well, why is that coming? Why why have I picked that very famous phrase of you know curious and curious? Everybody knows what that is, right? It's only one book in the world that's got that in you. So why? What is it about Alice? Why is Alice telling me this? Why is it connecting? 
And now, and then once you've got that and you're open to it, you then start to explore it and you allow it to come in more and more and more. This is, I'm now in a, a version of a Lewis Carroll universe, if you like, uh, and that's what I'm doing. And so, and then and, uh, you follow it through. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's like, it's not like, oh, now I'm going to do this. It's like, just, oh, there it is. Pull on that thread, see what happens. If something arrives like that, that's a message being sent from Lewis Carroll to you through the book, through your history of that book, through your present day needs in the book you're writing. It's helping you. So let him help you. Exactly. And the way that you um, just incorporated that, that sentence, you know, that sentence itself is really is emblematic of, of the circumstances because you put that sentence in there and then you think, wow, it's actually really curious and it's going to get even more curious when you start to question why you put that sentence in there. How does that um, sentence fit into the narrative? Why did I put it in there? And then well, you start to question just... your own subconscious and, and everything that you have in relation to Lewis Carroll and Alice in Wonderland and that narrative. Um, the other thing is like something else comes in from uh, elsewhere. Other things come in because the other thing I was looking at at the time was um, graphic novels, right? In the 90s, that was a really big thing. Alan Moore, uh, Neil Gaiman, uh, Neil, Neil Morrison. Was it Neil Morrison? Morrison. Um, that kind of new uh, Grant, Mor explosion. Grant Morrison, I think. Grant Morrison, that's it. That new explosion of, uh, of British writers who were exploring all these amazing things through this medium that they were reinventing. You know, so I was quite jealous of those people in a way. So because it seemed like they were they were taking on this thing and reinventing it. So I thought, you know, why don't we reinvent the novel in a certain way that we can bring in all these different elements and see what happens. Yeah. So I think that was a that was a big thing at the time in terms of over literature coming in from set from the side. Um yeah. Arkham Asylum, things like that. Yeah, and the way that they all kind of intersect. But also, I think um, everything that was coming out of that era, you know, you talked a bit about your contemporaries like Irvine Welsh, um, all these these British writers who were doing graphic novels. There was a sort of turn uh, in that era in the late 80s, early 90s, where things um, got a bit darker and there was a, a turn towards looking at the at the more um obscured and and dirty and darker sides of humanity and you know in your work a lot of your characters are you know junkies or drug addicts or punks and musicians um different people that are part of a lower echelon of society that um the upper hierarchies would like to brush aside and you know, sweep under the rug and ignore that kind of thing. So why do, why do you, did you feel influenced by some of the other writers and your contemporaries at that time? Or why did you focus on, um, you know, the, the destitute uh, people in society and a lot of your work? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> uh, it's to do with... Um, I guess, like, you know, people often say to me, they'll often ask the question, you know, but you must have taken a lot of ecstasy, Jeff. And the sad truth is I haven't taken one single ecstasy in my life. So, and people are always, they always think, oh, really? But you wrote verbs. Yeah, I know. It's like <laughs> the imagination, you know. It's like seeing all these people, seeing these people around me doing it, right? now. As I said before, I mean, I was the kind of person who would stand on the edge of the dance floor, okay? That's me, that guy, right? That guy in like, in like a Smith song, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> I wasn't at the center of the dance floor, right? I was standing on the edge looking. And, and I think that... You're, probably, observe, you're observing everybody. Yeah, because just because I can't do that, I can't be that person. I can't be at the center. It's just not in me. 
I haven't got it. So, and I think quite a lot of writers, I guess, are like that in a way. That's why you become a writer because you, you you're not quite part of society. Of of the there are two types of society here, of course. There's the outer and there's the, the and then there's the inner. The, you know, if you're not part of the outer society. But you're also not part of the inner society, i.e., with the in kids, right? You're that person who's on the edge, and and I think that that that's the kind of character, I guess, that I'm interested in. So I don't think the characters that I portray or create necessarily are part of the in crowd, right? They're the people that want to be, but they can't quite make it. They're just not cool enough, and it's because that creates that intense loneliness within them. Um, and I think that that is one of the great unexplored themes of the novel is loneliness. It's like, um, <clears throat> and, and that attempt by characters to become part of that team, if you like, of that club and what are the sacrifices you would make to be part of that club. I love all that kind of stuff. I find it very fascinating. Um, but they're t- they're not they're still young, so they're not they don't want to be part of the outer society. You know, have families and settle down and get a good job, all that. Not yet. They're still young enough, but they can't join the inner club either. So they're always on that borderline. Uh, and one of the things that you can do on a borderline is you look, you know, you gaze, you envy, you uh, you um, and you go home. And you cry and you make notes. It's like write a poem. It's like a Morris, you know what I mean? It's like a Smith song. It's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what it's like. And so when, you, when you're that age, and, and I don't think that's ever left me. And then also in just in simple terms, it's like the Who song, you know, the kids are all right. I've always had that idea, the kids are all right, you know. So that's that other, that romantic idea of the youth, of the, the brave poetic warrior of youth you know that 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 idea that you can you just do anything but you're always exploring and you're always looking for something new to do and you're always looking for answers and, and the next thrill the next kick you know the next answer to the next question you're always on the lookout for it so it's very good to write um characters that are young like that it's exciting and i think you you build on that notion of um like you say, there's a bit of a dichotomy at that age. You, you're trying to fit into crowds and you feel a sense of loneliness because you don't necessarily have an established group or an established place within society. But at the same time, you're experimenting, you're exploring and observing and seeing new people, seeing new things. And it's, it's kind of difficult to wrestle with, with both sides of that. But then later on, you know, in your career and and um, extrapolating on those ideas, you have a character like John Nyquist, and we'll and we'll jump into the Nyquist um, mystery series. Okay, how he's someone who is much older, but he is still wrestling with uh, some of these things like loneliness and his place in society. So, <laughs> where did the series come about, and and um, how did how did you translate yeah. earlier themes into this one? Oh God, I absolutely love John. I loved, <laughs> I loved writing those Nyquist books. I really did. It was just it's such an adventure because it, it became, I was at a very down point in my career, okay? Now, people often think, that, oh, you've written a novel. Wow, you know, you've got this thing. No, it's not like that. It's like it's such an up and down thing being a writer. Unless you've become like really well-known and famous and popular, if you're below that, it's very easy to slide down, you know? and so. Like all writers of my ilk, I've had periods where I've failed, basically, for want of a better term. And a lot of people, they kind of give up. Now, I've got a lot of inner strength, so I don't give up. I always come back and try again. But um, I, I didn't have an agent at the time. I didn't have a publishing deal. I had nothing going on. And, this, I mean, this is an incredible story. When I think back, I can't believe that it happened, okay? I was probably earning about half of the minimum wage in Britain, okay? Um, just hanging on, really. And then I was on Twitter one day and this tweet arrived. It was just from this guy and he said, I wish that, and I think it said, 
I wish Angry Robot or Galantz would publish a new Jeff Noon trilogy because I really want to read it. Uh, <laughs> and so I said back to that, uh, if only, exclamation mark, right? And uh, Galantz never got back, but Angry Robot did. Now, Angry Robot are a really, really interesting uh, publisher in Britain. Very interesting. They're kind of like, they're independent, but they're quite high up in the independent world. They're not like tiny. They're, they're well established. They've got a really great visual style. They're very, very good. Uh, I really like them a lot. I love them. And, um, you know, the editor got back to me and said, yeah, send me something. So I sent him this kind of three-quarter finished uh, Man of Shadows, the first John Nyquist thing. I've been working on it for a number of years, trying to get it going, you know, and with his help. I uh, managed to finish it and put it out. So that one tweet, could you imagine? That one tweet managed to get me this, uh, probably my my sixth attempt at a career. Do you know what I mean? It managed it through that <laughs> one tweet. I couldn't believe it. Even when I think back, yeah. it's incredible. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the person who sent that tweet. I always find, I mean, I saved it. But, and so... And then when I wrote that first Nyquist book, and as I say, that one was like three quarters done. And then yeah. <clears throat> uh, Simon Spanton was my editor on that. He was a famous editor in science fiction. You know? And he said that, he said something in that first book. He said, because that, that first book, I mean, it, it's kind of quite a standard private eye science fiction book, if you like, which I really like, that kind of thing. But he said that, he said to me once that John Nyquist seems to know that he's a private eye in a novel. And when he said that, I just started to think, okay, well, I'm just going to push that. So in each of the Nyquist books, he starts to understand that that's what he is. Okay. Now, this goes back to Grant Morrison's great run on Animal Man, where Animal Man starts to realize he's a character in the novel. I love that. And um, I thought I could do my own take on that. And um, so to just, if you jump back to what I said at the beginning about the idea that cyberpunk doesn't just have to be about digital information. It can also be about music. It can be about drugs and dreams. It can also be about words, right, as narrative, as an infection, as part of the human body. And that's really what the four Nyquist books are about. It's Nyquist coming to terms with the fact that he is made out of words. That's what he is. And so it's really great to write those books because you can – and also Nyquist is good for me because it's like – I don't have to work things out. I can just set him going. I, th- I think of a situation for him and I put him into it and I say, oh, now tackle that, John. You know, let's see what you're going to do now, you know, and I kind of follow him. And so that is quite good that um, each of the Nyquist books, that was the other thing I always had in mind, is set in a different city, a different location completely. And each city has a different science fiction or fantastical element to it. So the first one, it's split into night and day and dusk. The second one, it's all about narratives and storytelling. The third one is uh, about how each, diff- each day is run by a different saint in a visit in a village, so everybody's doing very different things on each day. The uh, fourth one is all about borders, a city filled with millions of different kinds of border. So each time Nyquist arrives and he has some case going on and he gets involved in the city and the way the city works. And again, and how that city infects him as he travels through it and how it changes him. So cities and words and words, that's, those, are the, those are the two elements of information that are fusing with Nyquist's body, just to keep that form as the host, content is the virus metaphor going. That's mm-hmm. what's happening. And you, you really explore that in the body library, which is book two. So like you say, A Man of Shadows, book one, A Body Library, yep. book two. Uh, Creeping Jenny book three, Within Without is book four. The Body Library builds on on yeah. A Man of Shadows in a really interesting way where the, like you say, the city that he goes to is a city of stories and a story, a city of narrative and words and letters and how this medium is is composed, but but it's a living, breathing part of this of this city. And then you have Nyquist who comes into this circumstance, comes into this, into this place and is trying to once again, find his, find his place within, uh, those parameters. But at the same time, he's, um, breaking the fourth wall by 
reflecting on his own narrative in A Man of Shadows. So it's this double play where he's in a city of stories within a story, but also thinking back on the previous story, which he was the <laughs> protagonist of. And I thought that was absolutely brilliant. And um, yeah, <laughs> builds on a lot of what you said. Thank you. Yeah. I, I love that kind of folding in of characters and stories in and in and on themselves, that constant folding and unfolding, you know, of where, I mean, it's one of the things, I mean, <clears throat> one of the things that I've always explored, I think, and always been fascinated by is that uh, sense of what is real and what isn't real and how do you negotiate and explore those boundaries and borderlines between our sense of reality and our sense of unreality, you know. And I think Nyquist is someone who is very much at home in that borderland. That's his natural habitat, those borderlands. Yeah, and it, it builds off of the, the first book, which is um, very clearly defined between the borders of, of uh, daytime, nighttime, and dusk in the middle, creating this, this eerie limbo space in between these two more well-defined parts of the city. So it's like a literal manifestation of yeah. of that concept. Yeah. And I, I'm kind of, I'm curious what... And then, and then between them, you have dusk, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Which is this strange area between the two where the borders disintegrate into... Uh, a strange, ghostly land full of spirits and, and, <laughs> and other mysteries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Like, really, really cool. Well, I... You, I I mean, I, I only have one story, right? <laughs> this is my story. Okay, so uh, when you – a character uh, is kind of rejected from his own family or her family, and they somehow or other end up either alone or with an alternative family group of some kind. This goes right back to Ver, okay? And then – that character is then going about their lives and then suddenly something happens that disrupts that alternative family and they end up in this really weird realm where everything starts to go mad and crazy and wrong. And it, it's often a fantastical realm. Um, and in a sense, Nyquist is doing that. You know, he, it's that same story. He, he enters into that, that realm where everything starts to dissolve and become strange and weird and. Because, you know, negotiating reality in a novel is one thing, but nego exploring and negotiating on reality is a different thing. You need a different set of techniques as a writer to, to deal with that uh, and to find ways of expressing it. Um, so I really like that. I mean, there's nothing I can do about that. That will always be the story I tell, no matter how many times I try not to tell it. It always comes back to that. It's really strange. At the moment, I'm writing with a friend, Steve Beard, right? We're writing a novel together. It's that story. It's a completely different location. It's actually a fantasy novel, completely different genre. But that story just keeps coming up. I can't. It's, it's like Ballad as one story. You know, some writers, you get that. Um, you don't know that you're doing it until much later on in your career when you think, oh, oh, right, okay. That's that thing. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm curious what, um, you know, this, this narrative that is unconsciously surfacing through, through your work, you know, and we'll get into, we'll get a, a little deeper into John Nyquist himself uh, in a bit, but, you know, you made the decision to set each novel in a different location. Yeah. But what, for you, does that approach uh, serve on a narrative level in terms of um, telling, <clears throat> excuse me, telling the story that you want to tell about John Nyquist, but also relating it to that particular location and its peculiarities and its rules and its uh, confined universe? So, how do you, how did you approach that, and and why did you make that decision? The original idea for, for, for the Nyquist books came from Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities, uh, if you know that one. It's a, it's a book that I've read a number of times. It's a, Very good book. Yeah. It, 
it's basically it's not really a novel as such. It's an experimental thing, but it's 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 that it's of that subclass of the readable experimental novel, and it's it's like a travelogue of imaginary cities, and each city has got something really weird about it, but only one element, and I I love that, and so I remember reading that book once and thinking, wouldn't it be cool to set murder mysteries in each of these cities you know so that was the original seed for what years later becomes nyquist now i haven't used any of calvino's cities i've invented my own but that was the the original idea so if you carry that through it means that the city itself because you should always be true to that original intent because that's the secret okay so that original idea wouldn't it be cool to set a murder mystery in each of those cities using the unique element of the city as part of the murder mystery? And so that was what I wanted to do with Nyquist. So I've always focused on that, that whatever it is, whatever the case is that the private eye has investigated, it's always going to be involved on some really deep, intimate level with this peculiar nature of the city itself. So, And then once that's in place, and once I've got a new idea for a city, it's really then just letting Nyquist explore that city in a way. Um, I, I write on a very, uh, I, I write by on a quite unconscious level in the sense that I don't plan. I never plan. So I write sentence, I, start, I write chapter by chapter. So I write a chapter and then I'll make notes on the next chapter and I'll say, okay, now, now this happens, now this happens. And I, that's quite a quick process for me. And about three quarters of the way through, I then stop and I then try to work out what's actually going on. And then I carry on to the end of the book. So that's my natural process that I've found works best. Yeah. So that's like, uh, you know, so it's like, here's the city. Here's the strangeness about the city. Here's a case. Now Nyquist sets off and he explores the city and he travels through and then the, the city kind of intersects with him and closes in on him, whatever that city might be. Whatever, you know, in the final book, it's all about borders. So he's in the city, he's got millions of borders and, and the people are making borders. They're smashing borders. They're queuing at borders. Uh, it's, that's what they love. That's what they do. And uh, uh, Again, another important aspect for me about Nyquist is that I'm not a big fan of dystopia, if you like. So... I always try to make sure that the people in the city actually love the element of the city, uh, even though it's completely mad and it's very, very obsessional and probably <laughs> isn't very good for them in terms of their health and et cetera. They still love it and they do it and they want to make it more of what it is. So they're not dystopians in the sense that there's some overlord making all this happen. It's the people that are making it happen. So it's from the bottom up, you know. And so the, uh, yeah, and, and it's, Nyquist is part of that, and he, he's uh, in the in the in the first book. He's a long term resident, so he knows it very well. In the last, in the s- subsequent three books, he's a stranger to the city, more and more and more stranger. So he arrives at a place, he doesn't know anything about it. So it's a complete shock to him what's going on, and the shock to me mm-hmm. as the writer, <laughs> as you're discovering everything that's going. Which into is what you place. want, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I'm discovering it as he's discovering it exactly. I see it through his eyes exactly, and and it surprises me beyond measure at times. I mean, beyond measure. Okay, but yeah. I, I love that aspect though because and I'll you're... just mention also. Go ahead. Yeah, for the last book, Within Without, I actually a friend of mine gave me this pack of cards. Um, I don't know what you call it really. It might be an oracle deck. So it's like. 40 cards and they've got images on them uh they're quite old-fashioned images they look a little bit victorian um the things like the doll the dog the sixpence the carriage etc and there's 40 of them so i thought okay so i shuffled this pack up yeah and uh and i turned it on i said okay so this first card whatever it is that's going to govern the first episode that nyquist takes on you know and so <laughs> i've written an article about this which you, you can find online where i go into this process quite a lot and i used each card as it came up and i just thought okay what's next you know there's a dog okay he's going to be a dog and it's that simple but it's like sometimes like 
a ladybird turned up and that led, you wouldn't believe what that led to in the book, that ladybird. It was incredible. I couldn't believe what it led to. I would never have, I would never have come across that. I would never have thought of that on my own. Do you know what I mean? Because what the cars were doing, they were acting as like little, um, little explosions in my brain, just pushing me out, pushing me to one side and just, oh, there's another pathway. What's down there? You know, so it, I think in that last book, I really used that as a, as a Nyquist was, Ny, both Nyquist and I were like, you know, what's next? <laughs> How strange can this become? And that was thanks to the cards. So I'm, I'm always, even as I get older, I'm still trying to invent new ideas and keep it all fresh. You know, it's very important that because as you get older, you become you become used to what you are, and you 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 build up a vocabulary and a language and a, and a style that's yours, and you know you you become comfortable with it. So it's always, it's always good to bring in other things. Yeah, just to to be able to break other the elements, routine yeah. and experiment, you know, yeah, for, just for, for your own sake, but also for the sake of the story. Constantly nudging yeah. yourself. Yeah, because the. The story itself, it's like uh, Nyquist feels like a passenger visiting these different localities and discovering things about them while at the same time uncovering these um, complex mysteries that, like as you mentioned earlier, tie directly yeah. into the very fabric of the city. And you know, another element that I really like is that these cities exist within some alternate history version of England where uh post world war and yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to think like how these cities would have popped up but yeah. you yeah. you mentioned obsessiveness and it's <laughs> something that <laughs> that um might have oh. been very prominent post world war where people are are reeling from from the effects of devastation and and perhaps this uh this results in the obsession of <laughs> living in and creating these cities as a way of distracting themselves. They're like localized collective obsessions. I guess that's what they are. Yeah. I, I kind of feel they're almost like they're in competition with each other in a way. <laughs> you know, it's a bit like <laughs> Manchester, it's a bit like Liverpool. Yeah. It's like a competition, you know. So um, it's like, how way could you be, you know? Uh, but I think that um, I don't know where that comes from, really. It, I, <laughs> it's like uh, I listen to quite a lot of classical music these days. That one of the forms I really love is the theme and variations. Right, that's where they pose it, writes a theme, and then he does like fifteen variations on it. I really love right. listening to that, and so these cities, because everybody's obsessed with the same thing, it allows me to explore for every possible variation that can be on the subject because each character is approaching it in a different way. Uh, and as each character has got their own way of being in that world and their own way of creating that world and their own way of adding to that world, you know. So uh, I, I think that's, that's uh, an important aspect of it, that variation upon that theme. I've always been fascinated by that. It's a yeah, form. because everybody's experience is unique and then. Um... If they're if they're purposefully living there, if they choose to live there, if they want to be obsessed with that thing and and this yeah. uh, environment, everybody's they're not trying to escape. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And then Nyquist, he just yeah. gets plopped into these different yeah. situations, and um, <laughs> I think you do a good job of of uh, establishing him in relation to that setting, but then also having a through line of his character and his history. Um, going through from each novel to the next, you know, yeah. using the setting as a as a way of fleshing out Nyquist a little bit more deeply with each novel, despite the fact that each one is more self contained within a different city. Um, yeah. So, how did you go about creating John as a character, but then making that decision to to give him this? Um, slow character progression throughout the series? I mean, I, he started in a very simple way, really, which was that, uh, almost a banal way, really, which was the question. I'd, I'd invented the city, uh, that first city, which was split into night and day and dusk. 
I knew that dusk was going to be the climactic landscape. Okay. And I, and I, I, I just thought, okay, well, I need someone who can't go there. It's a very simple thing to do, okay? Somebody who really doesn't want to go there, and then you force them to go there. So I just needed to create this character that will be the last possible person we want to go into dusk, <laughs> right? Which is a place, not a time. The last possible person. So that is the seed, and then he just builds from that, slowly but surely over time, he builds from that. And then you start to add details to that and you start to create a family for him and, and, a, and a life. He is, a, he is a loner, definitely. Uh, but you start to, he starts to have relationships with different various people and so on, and you allow that to happen. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's what it is. It's like um, allowing the character to grow quite slowly over time. Because you know, because it's a series of books, you get the, you know, you can allow yourself to to allow him to grow over time and to change over time. He's certainly a lot. He's in the first book. I think he's quite tough in a way. <laughs> he's not as tough in some of the until later on. He, he kind of settles back a little bit from that. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it's just characters really strange to talk about, to be honest, because you know uh, it's. Of all the elements of the novel, the character is the weirdest for me. Just because, you know, describing a room, that's describing a room. That's a thing think, you can um, do, I right? Think John. Uh, I was describe, describing, yeah, describing a tree, <laughs> you can do that. Everyone yeah. knows what a tree looks like. And you can, everyone knows what a tree looks like. So you can describe a tree with a word, a tree, or you can add a little bit of detail about the branches and the flowers, etc. But everybody gets it. But when you sit down to describe a human being, that's very different. Okay, that's actually a really strange thing to do. It's like, despite the experimentations of the early 20th century, with great writers like Joyce, nobody's actually yet captured the human mind. Okay, in a novel. Uh, now, when we sit down and think about ourselves, when we sit down and think about our minds, we know what our minds are really like. Okay, it's a mass of contradiction. It's a mess. And you're contradicting yourself all the time. But out of that, your personality. Now, nobody ever writes that because it would be madness to write that. And Joyce had a good <laughs> go, but it's madness. You can't do it. You can't. So what I'm saying is like writing a character is one of the strangest things that people can do because you're, it's not like a tree. You can't describe it in that way. It's an indescribable object um, in the world. And uh, so when you're writing a character, what you're actually trying to do is almost like collect a series of codes or ciphers that have been given off by the character and then presenting them to the reader in a certain way and then allowing them to make of that what, you will, what they will in terms of their own personality. You know? I think that's probably the closest. It's very difficult to talk about this, to be honest, because it's quite a strange subject. But um, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, because um, it's uh, characters and human yeah. beings, they, they, as you mentioned, they, they contradict themselves. Um, Characters is something that you try to define in order to fit into the narrative that you're working with or build a narrative out of them. But all the time, it's, it's as though a character can um, evolve and change in ways that are completely unexpected to you, even though you're the person who created them because it's a fictional thing. But, you know, yeah. As the character interacts with the uh, narrative, the other thing, oh, yeah, and I mean, absolutely. Mind, I mean, I, go ahead. I think that that's the most exciting aspect of writing character for me is yeah. seeing that change happen and then going with the change. Um, I think if I had to describe Nyquist in one or a number of sentences, I would say it never ever stops. Okay. He never gives up. He never surrenders. He's always going to do it. No matter mm -hmm. what it is, he's always going to do it. And then he's going to do it some more. And then he's going to do it some more. And <laughs> it's like, I don't know where that comes from, but he will never, ever, ever stop doing what needs to be done. 
no matter what it takes. You know, <laughs> and uh, I think once you've got that in place as a character, as a characteristic of a character, that's useful for me because as a writer, I like to explore these strange landscapes, right? And these strange, eerie, spooky, mad, surreal places. And as because Nyquist has got that characteristic, he will go into that place for me in my play, in, in place of me. He will go into it. And he's not, although he might be scared of it, he's not going to not go into it because he has to. He's, like, he's like, in a way, he's addicted to it. He has to go into it. So I think he's a good uh, way for me to allow that to happen. To uh, compelled to go into it. He's compelled to move towards the strangeness yeah. all the time even when it's the worst possible thing you could possibly do. <laughs> yeah. well, that's, what I, that's what I love about Nyquist is he, he becomes very fixated on things and because he's a bit of a lonely person and he is constantly trying to find his place in the world, um, he gets attached to a certain thing, you know? Um, I'm thinking of like... Uh, How can you case- find your place in the world? When the world is shifting around you, you know. Exactly. How can you find your place in the world when the world is constantly shifting? Um, yeah, that's the metaphor, I guess. Yeah. And so now that you've got four books in the series, uh, what are your future plans for, for Nyquist? Yeah. Um, you also mentioned that you've got another book in the works if you want to dig into the future of the Nyquist mysteries, yeah. but also your um, future as a writer. I don't have any particular, I don't have a, a I don't have in mind a fifth book at the moment, okay? Mm-hmm. So to be honest, I didn't even have a, a fourth book in mind. But if a city arrives, which it did with the border city, I think, oh, well, that's a Nyquist novel, you know? So yeah. if that happens, <laughs> I will do a fifth one. But the, my big project at the moment is uh, this book, uh, I take on the fantasy genre, which I'm doing with my friend, Steve Beard. So it's a collaborative novel. We've just finished the first draft, uh, which has been very, very exciting. Um, and basically how this started is that uh, years ago, we invented this place called Ludwich, which was like our version of London. And all the time was we met up in cafes and walked around the park and stuff like that. And spe- and during lockdown, we would meet in the park and all that. And we would talk about Ludwich, this city. <clears throat> and we started to populate it. There were eight different, I think seven different tribes lived there. Each tribe with its own religion, its own magic system, its own uh, social traits and rules, behavior, etc. Uh, and we started to talk about different areas of the city and give them names uh, and so on. And, uh, and we didn't really know what we were doing with this city, to be honest. It was almost like a shared hobby in a way. Uh, we would send each other like emails with bits in. I've, you know, the, the Ludwich folders filled with this stuff that goes back a very long way. And uh, Steve's got a lot of knowledge of history, the history of London. So he, he's very good on that whole side of it and society side of it and, and geography and so on. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> at one point, we actually considered that it might be a role playing game. And during that period, we created a lot of material that you only create for role-playing games, okay, which is like <laughs> lists of things. Yeah. You know? Spreadsheets. It's like, you know, 20 things you, yeah, 20 things you might find, you know, in, in, a, in, in, a, in a shop in Ludwich, you know what I mean? 20 strange things you might find. Like, it's like rolling a D20 dice. That's what you do when you create role-playing games. So this, we've got these sheets of paper with all these lists on and so on. And then Steve said to me one day, something else, he said, I always wanted to do a version of the Heart of Darkness set in England, he said, a boat that goes from the estuary, travels up the Thames, goes through London and onwards. And I said, well, why don't we do that as our Ludwig story? You know, we've got a river, the nicest. Let's get a boat. Let's get it at the estuary put some weird characters on it with some mad, bizarre mission they have to go on. Let them go up the river, let them enter Ludwich, let them go through towards the source of the river and let's see what happens. And so that's the book that we wrote, that we're writing. Uh, and um, 
So it's like, first of all, the creation of this city in great detail. Then the invention of a very quite simple narrative of the journey, putting those two together. And as the characters travel up the river and into the city, of course, they're engaging with all this stuff that we've created in our lists and our various email documents and so on, uh, hundreds and hundreds of documents. Um, so it's been a really fascinating way of working that. Uh, uh, it's, and it's set in 1947 in our minds. I don't think we'll actually put the date in. We're not sure yet. We're still discussing that. But in our minds, we're, that's what we're writing about. So we got a lot. We did a lot of research on that time and how people were with each other, how they dressed, what their uh, concerns were, uh, and so on. So it's been it's been a really good process, actually. Very exciting. Yeah, that sounds absolutely fascinating, and I can't wait to read it. Thank you. Oh, well, you know, as I said, we just finished this first draft, so it's quite difficult. It's writing a novel with a person. You have to invent a method of doing it, you know, because because mm-hmm. uh, you need to create a language that belongs to that novel. You can't really have two sets of language coming in. So we've had to work out how we do that, how we create that language together and, uh, and use it to, to tell this story. So we've just finished the first draft. Now I'm doing my edit and I said to Steve, he does his edit and then we're saying it to our agent and we'll see what happens. It's on spec, completely on spec, this. So um, we'll see what happens after that. Don't want to go into Amazing. too much about the details, the story, et cetera, because, <laughs> you know, that's still... Yeah. But the, the, the process itself sounds so cool. And, and the fact that you two have found a good um, collaborative middle ground where you've gone through each iterative process, but things are, are meshing in a, in a way that is satisfying both of you. And I think that's the best possible outcome. Well, you know what I said about writing within without using that pack of cards? Steve, in a way, is a super pack of cards. He's like, he's <laughs> constantly throwing this stuff at me all the time. You know, just constantly doing it. And I'm so like, many, oh, so okay. many writing prompts all okay. the time. <laughs> all the time. Yeah, all the time. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it never ends. And so, you know, so, yeah, it's been, a, it's been an adventure, definitely. Great. Well, um, to close out. Uh, Can't wait for people to read this one. Yeah, I'm excited to, to check it out. And uh, you mentioned to me, um, I think it was before recording, that you're reading Iris Murdoch. Yeah. Uh, what else are you reading or watching or uh, doing at the moment that you want to, to recommend to people? I'll tell you what, I've, I used to read a lot of science fiction, but, you know, when I wrote Vert, I kind of stopped reading science fiction, right? And I know some people do this and some don't, but for me, it was like, and I, I did it unconsciously. It was like, okay, I just need to step back from science fiction so that I can create something that's just mine. It's going back to that idea of wanting to create a unique voice, you know. So I'm not governed by whatever might be fashionable in science fiction anymore. So I'm I'm out there. Uh, So I don't read science fiction. I love to read crime books, love that. Um, Those are my main thing that I devour. Um, I'm reading a really good book at the moment actually called Ziggyology which is a brief history of Ziggy Stardust. And it goes into all those elements in society and art that the young David Bowie might have experienced uh, or definitely did experience that later on go to him being able to create this idea of this strange messiah figure arriving from space. Okay. So it's all about flying saucers and Fred Hoyle and space dust and quite 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 a mass, um, Beethoven and the whole planet suite. It's all this stuff that could have been around in the fifties and sixties. That would be this, and every so often the book will go to. Uh, at this time, Debbie Boy was sitting in his family house in Bromley, London. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like it paints a picture of like a cultural life of the 1560s now it might affect this young lad growing up in london uh who would come on who would one day go on to be one of the greatest most incredible iconic figures in rock music ever uh, but you know just how did he actually create ziggy stardust what had to happen to him growing up to be able to do that um so that's fascinating actually that book. yeah it's good good stuff very good fun actually yeah, I need to check that out because I love David Bowie, I'm a huge fan, but I also love how he 
um, transcends music and is just a, an incredible visual storyteller, you know, and being able to pair that with the, um, the cinematic nature of concerts and, and the audible soundscapes of, of music is just so, so cool. Yeah. I mean, in this, it's even got a chapter in this book on the kabuki and the samurai theatres, samurais and the kabuki theatre and the invention and the kimono and stuff yeah. like that. And, and, and how that they had a kind of uh, a society there where uh, it was kind of um, quite a fluid society regarding gender and everything. So, and, and you can see how that all comes into this young boy growing up. You know, it's really interesting. Yeah. So cool. Like during the Edo period in Japan, yeah, there was a, uh, a society sort of yeah. like post World War England, where it's it's reeling from this period of uh, destruction and the warring states and everything like that, and then art and culture start to be developed, and and things become a bit more liquid and ambiguous, like Ziggy Stardust and David Bowie. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, well, yeah. uh, <laughs> that was fascinating because it was a subject I didn't know. I didn't know anything about it, you know. So it yeah. was fascinating to learn stuff from that about that it's really good cool well um i really appreciate you taking the time uh to chat with me today jeff um can you tell listeners where they can find you on social media uh where they can find out more about your work the nyquist mystery series but also your older novels yeah i mean mainly uh the uh the yeah the best way to start my is probably the nyquist they're the most readily available for anger robot press uh i'm at uh, on twitter is at jeff noon that's the best way that's the easiest way to do it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much. I'm a huge fan. I really appreciate you taking the time and it was really <laughs> inspiring to hear how your, uh, thought process goes into, into the novels that you create and, and learning about your history and, and the things that inspire you. So thank you very much. Thank you. It was good fun.